Thank you very much. Uh, well, the justification for my uh, perhaps surprising presence and uh, presentation uh, at the end of this very wide-ranging, but to my mind, very successful, enriching uh, conference, I take it is the determination expressed by uh, my small and struggling Muslim college in Cambridge to incorporate an unusually large amount of teaching on science-related topics as part of its uh, curriculum. Um, part of this recently generously funded by the Templeton Foundation. To my knowledge, and I think I'm correct, we're the only British Muslim institution which seeks to foreground science and religion issues as an important part of the formation of the new generation of mosque and madrasa personnel. In a few minutes, I'll try to offer an explanation of that. But first, since most of you are new to this, let me outline the context from which our students come and in which they go on to work. Uh, the Cambridge Muslim College runs a one-year diploma programme which accepts graduates from existing Islamic seminaries in the UK, both male and female, on the basis of academic achievement and evident potential. The United Kingdom currently hosts approximately 1,600 mosques, of which 65% adhere to the Deobandi interpretation of Islam, with a further 23% declaring an adhesion to the Brailvi denomination, these being two subsets of the uh, Sunni family and our students are recruited from seminaries of both these traditions. And we train not only imams, but also chaplains, a sector which is of growing importance. The UK Home Office, for instance, employs 276 full-time salaried Muslim chaplains, and there are others in the armed forces, universities, hospitals, and so on. And our graduates face a society in which Muslims are challenged on a daily basis to define the nature of their belongingness in a way which is probably not the case uh, with the leaders of other communities, although there are possibly parallels with the travails of Catholic leaders as recently as the 1950s to demonstrate that their flocks were indeed loyal in an unproblematic way to the English crown and to a sense of local belonging. In 2009, the Gallup organization carried out the largest ever survey of opinions among British Muslims to determine their position on various indices of identity and citizenship. <clears throat> In general, the results were not surprising to the community's leaders, although they occasioned some puzzlement in the popular press. For instance, it emerged that 77% of Muslims identified very strongly with the UK, compared to 51% of the general population. 76% of Muslims expressed confidence in the police, compared to 65% of the wider public. Only 3% of Muslims felt that other religions were threatening their way of life compared to a national British figure of 25%. On these fairly standard citizenship indicators, then, the communities whom our graduates serve tend to score very highly compared to the current British norm. But on social issues, matters are the other way around. Only 3% of British Muslims hold that sex before marriage is acceptable compared to 82% of the general public. And while 58% of British people now believe that homosexuality is morally acceptable, the pollsters were not able to find a single Muslim who took the same view. I think they interviewed more than 1,700 people from different segments of the community, and they couldn't find one um, who dissented from the normal Muslim view on alternative sexualities. And a similar discrepancy is noted with regard to levels of religious observance. A Cardiff University research study by Jonathan Scarfield on religious nurture in Muslim families, which was completed in February of this year, shows that Muslims are generally successful in passing on their beliefs and practices to the new generation. The studies showed that 77% of adult Muslims actively practice the faith they were brought up in, compared to 29% of Christians and 65% of other religions. Designing a curriculum for young Muslim leaders must, uh, however, culture to, uh, cater to cultural particularities of what remains uh, demographic mainstream, second-generation young people of subcontinental heritage. We have a South Indian and a Bosnian student in the current student cohort at our college, but overwhelmingly our intake reflects the fact that over 90% of Britain's mosques are staffed by imams whose roots are in the Punjab, Azad, Kashmir, Gujarat or the Silet district of Bangladesh. This is unlike many of the conspicuous figures in the community who are often from the convert community, which uh, another Cardiff uh, uh, piece of research recently demonstrated to be approximately in the range of 100,000 people and who are quite conspicuous in our college. Our principal, for instance, is, is an American 
convert to Islam who is a British imperial historian. Two of our uh, current research fellows um, are also converts, Dr. Joel Hayward, who's the former dean of the RAF College in Cranfield, and Dr. Matthew Wilkinson, who's working on our favorite project at the moment, really, which is a new Islam-related science module for the British National Curriculum Review. Um, I had a meeting with the relevant minister just last week. And if implemented, this is going to introduce all British primary school children to some basic knowledge about the role of Muslims in the transmission and development of medieval science. So there are these people around, but essentially the demographic core of the community is second generation subcontinental migrant communities. And what all of these various complex factors mean is that our curriculum design and also the pastoral atmosphere, which we seek to promote in the college, is necessarily a very... Uh, bespoke affair. British Islam is asymptomatic of modern Britain in many key respects. I mentioned the disproportionate sense of loyalty, but it's also the case, conversely, that a fringe subscribes to ideologies sympathetic to terrorism. The community is also disproportionately young. The 2011 census indicated that 34% of British Muslims are under the age of 16, the youngest age profile of any of the country's significant religious communities. And there's the need to remain palpably faithful to the often, in the eyes of outsiders, astonishingly conservative mores of the Muslim community and the Muslim world in general. And in addition to all this, there are, of course, the normal, often quite sharp issues which confront all young people, temptation, marriage, identity, depression, and the like. Now, the college's educational philosophy is rooted ultimately in a vision of the sanctity of learning and of the world. Learning about God's world must be a godly process. The template is quite straightforwardly Islamic, taking its cue from the tradition's long preoccupation with the high vocation of the scholar and the healer of souls, rooted ultimately in the example of the prophet himself, for Muslims the first educator and spiritual guide, and buttressed by some very familiar scriptural passages which praise the intellect and, and knowledge generally. A lot of Muslim curriculum reform in recent times, beginning perhaps with the Ottoman Rushdie uh, schools in the 19th century, and reform with reformist Indian institutions such as Aligarh Muslim University, proceeded on the assumption that what was called rote learning and the practice of memorization in particular was inappropriate in the context of a modern pedagogy, which assumes science as normative, with the humanities as Geisteswissenschaften, trying where they could to be scientific in their obtaining and use of evidence. So one of the things we've had to figure out in designing the curriculum for this new type of institution is what to do with the traditional Muslim emphasis on actually knowing things by heart. Um, globally, of course, and certainly also in Britain, uh, for decades the tide of educational reform has been away from memorization in favor of constructivist or project-based uh, learning. But we've taken the view that the evidence points to the need for the maintenance within due bounds of classical disciplines of memorization as entirely compatible with the relevant and contemporary pedagogical process. Most of our students have memorized the entire Quran and a good section of the Hadith literature, as well as various uh, medieval, juridical, logical, theological texts. And we believe we see empirical evidence that this uh, does not in any way impede their creative and independent thinking. In fact, we recognize at least two major advantages of large-scale memorization. Firstly, as revealed in recent research by the American National Institute on Health and Aging, higher cognitive functioning among the old is a normal result of memorization in early life. Secondly, Irish researchers have discovered that extended periods of rote learning benefit the hippocampal foundation of the brain and promote its neuronal plasticity, resulting in greater mental agility and capacity to learn new information at any age. So as a result, our institution is quite unusual in terms of the usual um, sort of panoply of contemporary Muslim institutions in that we actively support students who have not yet, for instance, memorized the entire Quranic text to complete their work while they're in Cambridge. And we also require the memorization of a basic 90-page hadith compendium. Of course, as well as these sort of uh, internal benefits, bulk memorization also confers credibility on future Muslim leaders who will generally in their communities be expected to supply proof texts in Arabic for everything that they say about religion. The Muslim traditions, uh, sermons are seen as much less effective if the preacher uses notes. 
Side by side with this rather archaic kind of decision that we've taken, we would say timeless, not archaic, um, but it is conservative, but we also promote a spectrum of teaching methods to reflect the necessarily very diverse curriculum which we offer. And just to help you understand this, let me draw a brief sketch of the educational sector from which our students come. In the UK, there are currently 38 Muslim seminaries at secondary school level. And the largest of these is the Jamiat al-Imam Muhammad Zakaria in Bradford, with 460 female students. Some of these institutions also go on to provide degree-level education following the classical uh, Indian Muslim curriculum. And the most prestigious of these, from which our own college has been able to attract a reasonable number of applicants, is Darul Uloom al-Arabiya al-Islamiya, which is in Bury, near Manchester, which is the Deobandi Seminary, which is currently home to 313 male students. Finally, there are colleges which do not operate feeder schools. One example would be Ibrahim College in London, which has 141 students plus over 1,000 studying part-time. Overall, this sector is generating approximately 500 new imams annually, plus a significant number of female scholars. Probably, I suspect, um, massive overproduction, but um, this is the infrastructure that we have. Now, a particularity of the or a peculiarity of the higher provision of Islamic studies in Britain is that it is, of course, also taught in mainstream universities, most usually under the rubric of Oriental studies or Middle Eastern studies, as at Cambridge. And this, too, is a growth sector, as figures from the Higher Education Funding Council for England indicate that the number of students on Islamic studies programmes rose by 12% between 2002 and 3 and 2005 to 6 the last year, 635 students taking Islamic studies at university level. So what we see in the UK is that we have these two very different sectors, both very substantial, uh, which deliver instruction in or about the Islamic religion. But it's at the interface between these two sectors that the problems arise. And in fact, our college could be said to exist primarily as an attempt to consider these uh, problems of a clash of paradigms and to turn them into something that is actually pedagogically and culturally creative. In November 2007, the then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, set up a review process to look at imam training. And the most significant outcome was the report published in October of 2010 by Alison Scott Bauman for the Department of Communities and Local Government. The government's initial impetus had been rooted in the security and social cohesion agenda, and the report demonstrated uh, very clearly that no known individuals or tendencies associated with radicalism have roots in the seminary system. As the report stated, in the overall task of improving mutual trust and confidence in modern Britain, providers of Muslim faith leadership training are part of the solution, not part of the problem. The report was a child of the former Labour administration and was kicked into the long grass by the new coalition government. However, it seems likely that the positive conclusions of the report about the role of the seminaries are probably unlikely, I think, that they would have been ignored. But the report was rather good in drawing attention to the dissonance, which I've already mentioned, between Islamic studies as patronised in mainstream universities, which adopts a staunchly positivistic or phenomenological outlook, and is generally a rather difficult, even hostile environment for religious insiders and Islamic studies of the growing seminary sector. Most Muslims obviously will prefer to study in a context which is broadly respectful of their tradition. That's normal, not just for Muslims, but presumably for all religious insiders. It would be strange if Christians, for instance, found that they could only study Christianity in the context of area studies. But the seminaries, as the report uh, tactfully indicated, suffer from numerous drawbacks. Lack of accreditation is one. But it also stated this. Programs of initial training and continuing professional development need to include not only theology and spirituality, but also reflection on practical experience, counselling and pastoral skills, and contextualising Islam in contemporary society. So Muslim religious formation in the United Kingdom is hence uh, quite starkly dichotomized into the strongly positivistic secular training available at the universities and the seminary sector where the prevalent curriculum and even pedagogic delivery are rooted in 17th century Mughal India. Far from constituting a productive crucible, British Islam unfortunately simply internalizes the contradictions which currently beset the larger Islamic world, in fact probably in a particularly acute way. And 
uh, communal disunity and malfunction uh, is only one result. Here in Germany, incidentally, uh, things are a little bit more hopeful. Uh, in Germany, Europe's most concerted and interesting experiment in closing this cognitive gulf is being attempted following the federal government's decision to pay for five new faculties of Islamic theology, paralleling in significant ways the long-standing Protestant and Catholic faculties. It's quite significant that this should be attempted here, in precisely that corner of the world, where, following the Napoleonic hiatus, the Humboldtian model was first implemented. If Islamic theology, in some form recognizable to insiders, can be incorporated within the infrastructure and methodologies of German universities, then a hugely important precedent will have been set. And in our little institution in Cambridge, we're watching the progress of this experiment with, with, with great interest. And in fact, the experiment is already being replicated elsewhere. The Austrian government has announced its intention of setting up a Muslim theology faculty in Vienna. And there's already something a bit similar at the Free University of Amsterdam. From our perspective, we would point out that the, we point out the ambitiousness of such an incorporation. Key to the Humboldtian model was, of course, the dethroning of God. Goethe and Lessing had stridently denounced the guild theology of the old universities, while Dolbach insisted that the science of theology is a continued insult to human reason. In the Streit der Fakultäten, Kant insisted that theology, if practiced at all in a university, must defer to the superior methodology of philosophy, supposedly directed by reason alone. And this model, seen by Mike Higton as the end of Christian learning in the mainstream, has not only uh, prevailed here, but over the past century at least, has steadily transformed the norms in British university, universities, notably faculties whose intellectual roots lie in 19th century German disciplines of comparative Semitic philology, Islamic studies in particular. So we're watching carefully uh, the new departments, which are already, I think, viewed with doubt here by established Orientalism, and also by many in the Muslim communities themselves, who are wondering, as we are wondering, whether the whole idea of a faculty of Islamic theology and chairs of something called Glaubenslehre do not represent some kind of westernized, Christianized, or even secularized attempt to subvert the faith of a controversial minority. Just this morning, I had a meeting with the deputy dean of one of these new faculties, who told me in a slightly bemused way that her trainee imams receive no uh, training in how to give sermons, but they're really very good at manuscript code ecology. It seems that the old sort of philological model um, has not died yet. In any case, at the heart of this program, and this is where we have to think carefully, is the Humboldtian insistence on academic freedom, whether or not that's fully exactly manifested in the Protestant and Catholic procedures for academic appointment is another matter. And of course, there have been significant voices considering this long before Muslims um, knew about the issues, such as Jürgen Moltmann in his The Kingdom of God in the Modern University, who have insisted that this should not be taken by religious people as a difficulty. On the contrary, it's going to be a sign of religious authenticity. David Ford in Cambridge takes a similar view. A theology faculty in which no question may not be asked helps to shape a wisdom which revives the original vision of the university as an integrated human project, threatened today by instrumentalized commercialization and disciplinary fragmentation. Real theology in a secular university enables, quote, mutual ground, producing the engagement of wisdom traditions, both religious and secular, with others. The discourse of belief is simply going to die if it's um, confined to a ghetto. And on such arguments, one finds certainly the main German Muslim organizations generally welcoming the government's initiative and the faculties with uh, permanent endowments uh, are now operating. In England, we are a long way behind. The model is, is very different. There are no chairs at British universities reserved for Muslim theologians. And in the current secularizing mood, that, I think, is unlikely to change. So the ambitious attempt to create a new vocabulary for imam formation has to be made in independent institutions, which can draw on the resources of established universities but are not subject to their secular premises hence the Cambridge Muslim College. We're not part of the university, but we um, can quarry the university's resources when we wish. And of course, many Christian seminaries have historically argued their way to a similar modus vivendi with larger secular colleges. And it's an ongoing debate, the extent to which the uh, 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 theological seminary should be at the center or near the center, on the periphery, outside the periphery of an ostensibly secular 
um, university. We're also having those, those arguments in the Muslim community. Now, contrast uh, the traditional, holistic, Christian or Muslim vision with the modern British reality of universities, and this is another of our puzzles. Should we strive for imam formation within British universities? It's going to have a huge impact for the future shaping of the community. Or should we um, persist with our seminaries, or should there be a third way? When we look at the modern British re reality of our universities, we find that they are generally against their will, uh, are fragmented and increasingly commercialised. And just to give you an example of how dire things have become, government, generally responding to a materialistic elite's view of things, now categorises higher education in quite a singular way. Look at this slide in nomenclature. In 2001, the relevant Ministry for Universities, the Department of Education and Employment, was replaced by a Department of Education and Skills, which in 2007 was reinvented as the Department for Innovation, Universities and Skills. In 2009, yet another taxonomic change, as the universities were passed on to the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. So, mirabile dictu, British higher education is now subsumed under Business, Innovation and Skills. That's the official model for what we do. In its recent Brown report, uh, the same department demonstrated how completely the business school jargon has taken over the British university sector. It refers to students as consumers whose free choice and economic decisions will ensure market discipline. Instead of focusing on inherently desirable goals in education, the report stresses the measurement of consumer satisfaction. This will, it assures us, ensure better quality control over lectures and facilities. Whether in future years this commercialization and hence the programmatic secularization, it's very difficult to separate them, of the universities is going to be halted, it has been the decision of the trustees and the scholars behind the Cambridge Muslim College to explore the interface between Islamic tradition and British modernity in the context of a completely new and independent institution created solely for that purpose. May I ask how long I have? I should. Am I? Okay, I shall just wrap up then. I shall uh, just pass then to my brief conclusion and pass over some of the uh, humanities disciplines that we look at. But just in the context of this, uh, this conference, to give you a brief sense of how we do the sciences. We have 18 modules, and three of them are specifically uh, science-related. One module introduces students to the history of science with reference to medieval Muslim contributions. That's a fairly straight history of science module. The students also learn about certain technical issues which are of practical relevance in resolving controversies specific to Islamic law, such as the vagaries of the movement of the solar system on which the timing of Muslim worship and festivals depends. There's also some exposure to a set of well-known controversial issues, Darwinism, medical ethics, brain and cognition issues, uh, and cosmology. And here we find it difficult to uh, locate suitable instructors. Finding theologically literate Muslims to deliver the teaching on these topics has proved very challenging. So what we tend to do is, at least in many cases, we simply draw on Cambridge University resources and encourage the students to think through and discuss the specific relevance of what they have learned in the context of their own beliefs. In general, our policy is for the college not to take an official line on issues in dispute, but simply to seek to broaden the horizons of the students and allow them to form their own conclusions. And that is uh, something that's pretty unusual for Islamic education. And it might seem to, seem to undermine the model of the integrated sacred curriculum, uh, which I was indicating earlier. Uh, we believe that it's an area in which a fully traditional approach is simply not going to work and the proper teaching of science and religion issues within the framework of a traditional madrasa curriculum is actually impossible. If the college sought to impose conformity of belief on questions relating to evolution, for instance, uh, the resulting controversies uh, would probably destroy it. Partly because it is itself a fallibilistic process of revision and self-criticism, science is the part of our curriculum which we've not been able to integrate fully in our vision of a community of learning where students are led towards a known truth. 
Instead, we teach you to inform them of the nature of the discoveries, to chart the controversies and show them what is at stake, to enable them to hold informed and respectful conversations with visiting teachers and among themselves. This develops not only in the classroom, but in the course of the one-to-one -one supervisions which the students following the Cambridge model are offered. And at that point, I'd better fall silent. Thank you very much um, for your indulgence. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Winter, for um, valuable information and uh, an enormous amount of uh, valuable information, but also raising many, many uh, crucial issues. I, I'm not sure whether you had the chance to follow Professor Schweiker's um, uh, presentation on freedom within religion, and uh, yeah, you went up to current complicated, most complicated debates in our country. Uh, we have a very strong legal system that is keen to protect the um, individual quality of the religions, but on the other hand, uh, also tries to help that public education is in support of democratic and egalitarian societies. And so this is a very, very complicated uh, area. Um, sadly, we cannot discuss all of uh, uh, this, and uh, it is a, a little element of frustration that uh, co correlated with the future. Uh, we now w would want to have hours and hours of uh, uh, further discussion, but this is beyond the limits of such a, a conference. Also, our last presentations were um, well, very kindly attuned to the science and religion dialogue but it was clear that it was not in the main focus of uh, um, the young researchers. So what did we do here in these uh, uh, three days? Um, we framed it, the science and religion dialogue, past and future. And it was the idea to harvest a small portion of 25 years of activities of the John Templeton Foundation. Um, so in most of the contributions, we saw the strong appeal also to future research. In most of the contributions, we saw the dialogue. In some of them, the dialogue was just yeah, a little element. In others, it was br uh, broadly um, configured. We wanted to end this consultation with a strong appeal on the future, future topics, future researchers, and so we did not press the science and religion topic uh, in this last uh, event. But altogether, I think, it shows you the enormous fecundity of the activities of the foundation, out of which we could only present a very small slice in these two days. I'm very grateful to you all that you uh, uh, came. Of course, above all, I mentioned this several times, uh, uh, to uh, Dr. John and Dr. Pina Templeton and uh, your whole staff that you uh, generously supported this event. But uh, a deep gratitude also to you all who came and added your uh, sparkling minds and ideas to um, uh, creating such a feast of ideas and, as I said, a, a series of adventures of ideas. Uh, the conference is now only formally at the end. So we still have space for conversations, individual conversations, and I'm sure uh, also your contributions ignited uh, eagerness to uh, uh, engage you uh, uh, over table or, or tomorrow. Um, as long as you can be here, I wish you a pleasant evening and uh, I'm looking forward to our time together tomorrow in various uh, contexts for those who can stay with us and uh, for the others who have to leave already now or tomorrow morning. Godspeed. God bless you. Thank you.